Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives, where you can listen to every episode we've ever done, going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is June 4th, 2015, and my guest is Morton Jervin of Simon Fraser University. His latest book is Africa, Why Economists Get It Wrong. Morton, welcome back to Econ Talks. Thank you, Russ. Uh, what's wrong with the economist consensus view about Africa and its economic uh, performance? Uh, what is that consensus view and why is it wrong? Uh, the most fundamental mistake that mainstream economists have made is that they've been focused for the past two decades on explaining something that never happened. Uh, economists have, since the 1990s, been focusing on explaining why uh, economic growth has failed in Africa or why there has been a chronic failure of economic growth in Africa. Uh, that's, and moreover, it has uh, moved away from explaining slow growth to uh, asking why these African nations have uh, failed uh, uh, permanently, as in uh, books such as uh, Why Nations Fail. Uh, however, uh, the, the, the problem and the puzzle is that uh, African economies have, if you look at the economic uh, growth data sets that we have available, Econom not only have African economies been growing for almost two decades since the mid-1990s, um, but African economies have also been growing in the 50s and the 60s and the 1970s. So uh, the basic fundamental uh, thing that we are stuck with after two decades of, of research is that, African, uh, that economists can explain why African economies are not growing. The problem we have, which is a positive problem granted, is that uh, African economies are growing. So uh, in that sense, uh, economists have gotten it wrong and have f fewer lessons than we would like to have for, for policy and, and, and so forth. Yeah, and we're going to get into that in, in, in detail. The, the misperception that you're trying to correct in this book is certainly one that I, not just most economists have, I think most everyday educated people have. They think of Africa – as a backwater economically, as having been, quote, left behind and as stagnant. And uh, one of the uh, pleasant takeaways from your book is how that describes one period in Africa's economic, uh, recent economic history, but it's, it's certainly not the general, an accurate picture of what's generally going on. Uh, one question I had, which I, I didn't see a lot on in the book, is some – is how much variation there is within Africa during these periods. So you you think of uh, three different stylized uh, sort of times that, that that we should think about, sort of pre 1970s, 50s to 70s, uh, and then 70s to 90, and then mid 90s to the present. So it's growth, no growth, then growth again. But do those pictures does does that summarize accurately in any one of those periods? What's going on with most or all African nations? Well, there are different ways of approaching this. You could uh, look at uh, the average growth for sub-Saharan African GDP. You can look at the number of countries that are growing above a certain rate. You can look at the percentage of total population in sub-Saharan Africa that are living in a country that is growing. And you can, rather than to rely on annual data, you could average this for three years, five years, nine years, and so forth. Uh, so there are, it's not as if all, you know, we're talking about 54 different nations. So we're deemed, we are doomed to generalize uh, a little bit. And, and it's surely true that today many and most African economies are growing, but that does not mean all of them are growing. Um, well, so the, the kind of, uh, you know, so in a sense, what I'm saying is, is that the stylized fact so far has been that there has been a chronic failure of growth and that there has been no improvement in GDP per capita to speak of. Uh, I seek to replace that with another stylized fact, uh, which has its, you know, errors and so forth like that as well. But I seek to replace it and, and suggest that, you know, 
um, that we should approach African growth as recurring. And that means that most economies uh, on average were growing in the 50s, 60s and 1970s. And for most economies, uh, growth has been uh, uh, coming back again in the 90s and until today. So we're, we're approaching uh, another two decades of growth. But somehow the economist frame of, uh, of explaining and approaching approaching economic development and growth in Africa have been stuck with this lost decades of the 80s and 90s, which have you know, uh, shaped how the stories we tell about sub-Saharan Africa and what we, we seek to explain. Yeah, it's, uh, I'm asking, a, I guess, a different question, which is, is, there, is it meaningful to talk about Africa? You know, is, is there an aggregation uh, mistake there? Do they have sufficient problems, advantages, disadvantages, successes in common that it makes sense to talk about the African economy or the African problem or the African track record over certain periods? What do you think about that? Well, that's a very good question. And I think, you know, you can ask the same, same question about Europe. You can ask the same question about Asia. Uh, but in Africa, it's been, uh, you know, that, that kind of whether it makes sense to talk about Africa and African economic development or not has been a dominant question that Africanists and development economists of Africa keep returning to. You know, Africa is not a country uh, because of uh, many, lots of stuff which has been written uh, on Africa and African economic development is written from afar, from people who are not uh, on the African continent. There is often then uh, these kind of mistakes, generalizations, and so forth. I think it's fair to say that there is as much variation within Africa as there is uh, within Africa as there is vis-a-vis uh, -vis Europe and so forth like that. So that's very careful, to, very very important to keep in mind. And I think one of the things I'm also exp is, and we we might dive straight into that, is that the actually this approaching Africa as as somehow a uh, a, a unit uh, and, and that Africa have some particular uh, character flaws or something like that is indeed a function of how uh, econometric models started using the, the, the African continent dummy variable. Uh, yeah, in, let's in start, the, let's, before you do that, and I, I would like, that was my next topic. So let's back yeah. up a little bit uh, and remind listeners uh, who are uh, not economists how yeah. economists would attack statistically uh, the question of what it could explain the variations in growth, say, across African nations or the variations in, in the level of income, which is not the same thing. People mix those up all the time. Uh, but but many, many, many studies have been done trying to explain differences in growth rates and uh, using both the world as a whole or Africa itself. Uh, what's wrong with that? Or first, let me back up, back myself up after backing you up. Describe what that process, how that works, and then you can talk about what's wrong with it. Yeah. So basically, economic growth is pretty straightforward. You know, it's a increase, increased ability to produce and and or consume. Uh, we know know that it's a result from combining capital and labor, and that the rate of technological change determines uh, how how fast our ability to do so grows, and that's what economic growth is. Uh, and then it's tempting to try to uh, uh, to not only theorize about what causes growth, but also, of course, empirically test it. And that's what, uh, uh, with the availability of of GDP uh, growth data sets for a lot of countries, on all, with together with uh, data on labor stock, capital stock, human capital, as measured by by education educational attainment. Uh, perhaps government intervention measured by budget surplus and other types of uh, measures such as whether a country is capitalist or socialist and so forth like that. Um, with this kind of empirical data, economists uh, started to to test when, uh, what would be the not only uh, explaining what uh, why some countries are growing slowly and other ones are growing rapidly, but also try to to estimate the coefficients and the relative importance of capital, labor, uh, whether you're a socialist, whether you're a capitalist, and so forth like that. So, so the early the model where I I kind of focus in on here is 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 uh, the workhorse model in economic growth testing. 
as proposed by uh, Robert Barrow uh, in uh, in uh, first in an article and then in a paper in 1991. Former um, Econ Talk uh, guest. Yes. Uh, uh, of which we'll be talking about many. It's gonna it's gonna be a it's an interesting uh, review. Go ahead. Yeah, and and so he proposed this model where you have uh, economic growth on one side, importantly averaged economic growth between 1960 to 1985. And then he added the kind of sus- uh, usual suspects, uh, lab- labor force data, capital stock data, and also added stuff like human capital, uh, a measure of what extent currencies were overvalued as measured by black market premiums, uh, and so forth, as assassinations uh, per capita to measure s- stability and so forth. So add a different kind of variables that were supposed to quantify and express things that we think might be important for economic growth. And once having done added all those variables, uh, there was still a lot of things not not explained, uh, so that he also added a variable which was called then the African dummy variable. So a dummy variable is something that can have two values, either zero or one. And in this sense, in this particular example, the African dummy variable took the value one if the country was on the African continent and zero if it wasn't. And once they computed in uh, all these data into the regression framework, uh, Barrow found that the African dummy variable was uh, uh, large, it was negative, and it was significant. And he interpreted that as uh, that that uh, so far uh, there was something particular characteristics of African countries uh, that caused slow growth that has not yet been properly quantified and captured. Because you couldn't enter a different variable. And I should just say for the non-statisticians in the crowd, there's nothing – uh, explicitly pejorative about the phrase dummy variable. That's a standard no. nomenclature for any variable that goes uh, – that has two values of zero and one or takes on discrete values generally rather than continuous valuable values. So it, it's um, it, it's a little bit awkward though when you talk about the African dummy when we're trying to blame Africa or to explain something – something's missing or lacking in Africa that that's showing up in this statistical measure. Yeah, that's correct. That's – and and – so then a lot of research then focused into trying to eliminate the, this value, uh, the, this variable, for, and, and find other characteristics such as uh, ethnic fragmentation or corruption. Uh, corruption, other ways that could somehow maybe be in close to the tropics and so forth landlocked, like that. Being landlocked without a port. Exactly. Different types of, of variables were suggested Indeed, in uh, 2005, a review uh, of the economic growth literature thus far by uh, Johnson, Durlauf, and Temple found that there was so forth found 145 different explanatory variables that were found to be <laughs> significant and uh, to, which they reckoned uh, supported uh, no less than 43 conceptually different theories of economic growth. Which is... You could argue one of the great discoveries of economic science, but I suspect uh, many people would conclude the opposite. This is an embarrassment of riches, literally, that to have that many things that we think are statistically correlated with growth suggests maybe we don't understand it at all. Yeah, that's that's the problem because uh, – so that's you know one way of kind of innovation in this literature is to – to find some kind of data set for which we have uh, observations for many enough countries that we can run a regression and check if there is a correlation and then kind of make up, uh, make up a story, ideally make up a story before you do the testing uh, to, uh, to find out why this is uh, uh, related uh, or not even related, but even also sometimes causally related so that uh, many, uh, many assassinations are you know may capture uh, civil uh, turmoil in a country, and therefore uh, civil turmoil is not good for uh, businessmen and capitalists and so forth, and therefore might be a causal factor explaining why certain countries are growing slower than others. So that's that's the and I, I want to pause here for a second as well to to point out that this kind of to return to the this was in year two thousand. Of the Economist, I lost, you, I lost you there for a sec. Say that again. In the year two, this was in the year two thousand. 
yeah, the year 2000, the, the magazine, The Economist, uh, painted, uh, have a, had a front page uh, showing the, the African continent as the, the, the hopeless continent. And now on the editorial line asked, does Africa have some inherent character flaw that keeps it backward and incapable of development? Question mark. So that was the editorial line of The Economist in the year 2000. And this, the, the Economist did not come up with this frame, this explanation themselves. They were then uh, taking impetus directly from this uh, literature that for a decade or so have tried to find out what was the, the, the particular African growth problem. Yeah. So one of, one of your points is that, uh, one, that by 2000 had already been some – some growth in Africa that had been ignored uh, in the 1990s. Your other point, though, is that is that it's if you're going to average economic growth over a, a three decade or four decade period, you're missing all the changes that are going on in between any one year it, that are going yeah. on in any any between decades. And as a result, you're measuring nothing. You, you, you're you're just bizarre. Yeah, no, it, it's, it's uh, you know, the, the, the research question was uh, find something that is correlated with, with slow average growth from 1960 to 1990s, which is a very different research question than to find out what can explain uh, rapid growth in the 60s and the 70s and then a decline in the 80s and 90s. You would be looking for completely different types of variables. So it's very important here what type of stylized fact Inadvertently, I would say, uh, you know, Barrow was just trying to, to propose a, a way of organizing this new statistical ma- material. He went with this uh, average growth thing. But as often happens, you know, there is path dependency in, in scholarly work as well. So many kept on uh, hammering on that same door. And so you could have thought that this was the moment when, you know, uh, that econ- economic growth was uh, returning and so forth that in many places. It was also at this point that uh, uh, the World Bank and the IMF maybe looked back and saw, hmm, maybe some of our structural adjustment programs, uh, this heavy efforts of trying to improve policies and so forth like that, uh, did not have the results we wanted and so forth. It could have been a moment of reflection. But instead, uh, the literature leaped into what I call the second generation of growth literature, uh, where t- taken as a stylized fact – that African economies have not grown uh, and that there has been a chronic failure of growth and therefore taking the next step that then that you don't need to explain growth at all. Uh, so that's what you were hinting at in the introduction as well. You get a new type of literature which is not focusing on explaining growth but explaining differences in GDP per capita measured today. Um, so then you got... Uh, uh, this other type of literature, which is most famously uh, summarized in the, the recent book by Asamoglu and, and Robinson in Why Nations Fail, also previous guest at your uh, at yeah, talk. Yeah, Asamoglu, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, where, they, where there is a different kind of search for variables, uh, this time uh, it was increasingly perceived that one of the problems of this uh, a cottage industry of, of growth regressions was that you could plausibly, and I do that in chapter one in the book as well, show how plausible it is to dismiss a lot of these as just correlations and only correlations. Um, so some of the basic problems, for instance, would be to, you know, there has been arguments about that maybe having a high aid dependence is bad for economic growth. That means receiving a lot of aid might distort the way you do policy and might then therefore cause slow growth on average. Uh, the way that – By the way, I, I've never heard this, but I, I would call that the spoiled child model. It says basically <laughs> if you keep giving your kid uh, money from a trust fund or your, your income, the kid doesn't have much of an incentive to work on his own and he develops bad habits and then he's, his career is a failure, his economic career. And that's sort of what this argue, this literature says, right? It says – by becoming dependent on foreign aid, they lose their incentive to grow their own economy domestically, and they're somehow ruined. Yeah, that's one type of argument famously put forward by, for instance, Dambisa Moyo in Dead Aid and so forth. 
And so, but you could equally argue that, you know, if you look at the data, you could also look at, it might be the other way around. Maybe countries that are growing slowly get into trouble and therefore they are in need of a lot of aid and therefore they receive a lot of aid. More, 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 uh, more pertinently, uh, if you start looking at the timing of these things, uh, you'll see that, you know, uh, one basic, you know, without one basic kind of rule, uh, not a kind of, an absolute rule about cause and effect is that cause should precede effect, not the other way around. Yeah. And so, uh, so for instance, then you would, one of the problems is that the high aid dependencies are a phenomenon and an observation that derives from the 1990s. So you cannot pl- plausibly argue that slow, uh, high aid dependence in the 1990s caused slow growth in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s. Um, it doesn't just doesn't work that way, and the well, same you, you could, but it would have to be very creative. You'd have to argue that <laughs> that nations that look forward to the possibility of getting aid stopped investing because they figured <laughs> if we get really poor, we'll get more aid. So there is a story, but it's a bad story. I'll agree with you. Yeah, you could do some repeated games, game theory kind of thing, I suppose. Rational but expectations. It's, it's, yeah, it's it, it, but even even more so, I think that it was. Uh, um, a problem as well with with uh, more famous types of correlations is that uh, poor countries or slow growing countries have bad institutions, uh, meaning that having institutions of low quality. And so, and and uh, how do you? Well, one thing is that you know we can think that institutions is important for economic growth and so forth. But how do you go about defining what good institutions are? Um, good governance, what is that? And how do you go about measuring it? Um, it it's an idea that to, to to start measuring this is a more recent idea. So in the regression literature, they did find that uh, having low governance quality rating was correlating with having slow growth. But once again, these observations were subjective surveys of businessmen taken in selected countries in the 1980s long after uh, these economies had had, uh, uh, experienced severe economic growth distress. And therefore, uh, you would think that it was an effect of economic decline and not a cause. But you're arguing – I want want to stop there because I think it's really important. You're arguing that – I I actually want to back up because uh, we talk about institutions a lot in economics and that phrase crops up – on econ talk and occasionally listeners will say, well, what does that mean exactly? So let's – we're going to talk about this for a bit. I, I think it's a, it's an interesting concept, the role of institutions in economic performance, but it's a slippery concept. And your point is that not only is it slippery, not only is it hard to measure and create a statistical uh, a variable that you can measure to to try to isolate its impact, but it can also be an effect rather than a cause – so, but, so that's all true, and I think that's great. And, I, and I'm going to add before we, I forget because I want to make sure we say it. In all these studies, there's a problem that we talked about the last time you were on Econ Talk, which is, and you talk about in the book as well, which is the quality of data on what we're trying to explain. The GDP, yep. the level of income, is very troubling uh, in terms of its accuracy. But I want to put that to the side, in case. But I want to mention it in case we didn't get to it. But I want to, I want to ask you to talk a little bit about what. Douglas North and Darren Esamoglu and James Robinson and others mean when they talk about institutions and what they mean by, quote, bad institutions or good institutions? Yeah. No, and institutions were, you know, defined most popularly by, by Nobel Prize winner uh, Douglas North as the, the rules of the game. And so the, whether there are rules that are conducive to, to economic growth or, or not is, is the big question empirically. And then Asimoglu and, and Robinson in Why Nations Fail build on that, among a lot of other scholars, build on that kind of basic intuition that it's not only capital and labor that matters, there's also how society is organized also matters. Can't, and I can't, think that, can't argue with that by itself. It's, gotta, it's true. I, 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 I think at that it, level. You, it, <laughs> It, the intuition there is, is, I think, so that everyone agrees with it. Uh, I, I think it's very hard to contest it uh, uh, as an intuition. I think the problem is is to define it and measure it precisely. 
Uh, Jeffrey Sachs, for instance, has a, a, a you know debate on this has a has a nice insight on this where he says you know one thing is to to look at today and say and find out kind of like doing your horoscope uh, knowing already what happened. <laughs> Uh, saying that, you know, look, these countries are successful and look, they have these institutions and look, these are the good institutions. But try this mental experiment instead, go back to 1960 and then come up with the definition of institutions that predicts what's going to happen. Uh, and that I think uh, would be difficult to do. Um, and uh, moreover, uh, even if those definitions were, 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 were solid, uh, it was also hard to think about the way of measuring institutions that is appropriate in, from country to country. Um, so and I think that this new literature that I call the second generation of, of growth literature that focuses on finding that history matters or institution matters suffer from, from some very, very particular and even paradoxical problems. They say that institutions matter. So that means the way that society is organized matter. Yeah, fine, good enough. Let's take the next step in that is, you know, is then to say, okay, let's find a variable that can measure that. And then you end up running a regression where institutional quality, institution is somehow lost its real definition, but it's now measured on a scale from zero to five, where five is perfect institutions and zero is, is horrible institutions. And then Germany somehow has 4.8 type of institution, whereas Tanzania has 1.2 institution. And if you are a policymaker, you might read that and think, okay, so we need to make our institutions more like the German ones, uh, which is completely the opposite of the intuition of uh, to begin with. Uh, the intuition is that institutions matter how the society is organized matter, and that as building on the work of North, we know that these institutions are part of the political process. Uh, they are suitable to a particular condition and can, are not to be exported from here to there. So you end up having an intuition, which I agree with, but in the measurement process of these institutions, you, you, you end up throwing out the basic intuition to begin with. Yeah, and no, it's a fascinating point, and I, I've started to it, – it's come up a number of times here, and it's, it's something I, I think about a lot. It comes up sometimes when we talk about education policy. You know, the, you know, why can't we be more like Finland? And the answer, yeah. the answer is, there may be things about Finland that are worth emulating, but there may be things about Finland's success which has been not so successful lately. But put that to the side. There may be some things about Finland's success we can learn from. But it's very possible that the things that make Finland successful can't be imported to another country, and worse. If they were imported, it wouldn't work very well, which is whole, which is, you know, it's not just that, oh, it's not even realistic. It's, it is realistic, but it's not going to work. And to, to assume that everything is malleable that way, you know, I think we made a leap in economics, uh, it, a first leap that was very good. And then we went and leaped over the cliff. The first leap was everybody responds to incentives. So it's, it, it, there's no really different economics for, for Africa than for yeah. America. And that, there's truth to that. I think people in Africa respond yeah. to incentives just like people in the United States. But then we make the next leap, which is sure. – and therefore the such and such policy act of 1953 would have worked great in Africa because it had incentives. <laughs> and that just doesn't follow. In fact, no. the thing I liked – I think this is a very small thing, but it might be my favorite thing in your book. I thought it was really utterly fascinating uh, was your story of uh, Congo – you yeah. give the example of, you know, of Asimoglu and Robinson, and I think I think it was in Why Nations Fail, maybe it was in a research paper, about mm -hmm. trying to explain why agricultural productivity in Congo was so low. And one answer is, well, they don't have they don't use the plow. Well, that seems like a terrible mistake, right? In yeah. fact, a lot yeah. of people would say the way to improve agricultural productivity is we need to give them more plows or more threshers or more. You know, we've got a great agricultural system; ours is very productive. Let's give them ours. Let's transplant ours yep. to theirs. Now, talk about how Asimoglu and Robinson explain uh, why there's not as much plow use in the Congo and what the alternative explanation is. Yeah. No, I, they, they, they think that this is about institutions and they think it is about protection of private property rights and that uh, because uh, property rights in this sense being, you know, knowing that the farmers knew 
that if they made the investment of plowing, getting a plow, getting a cow and getting this thing plowed, then harvested it, they would know that, you know, that the state would protect them from, uh, from getting their crops uh, stolen. Or they would also know that the state would not tax them uh, too much. They will get their fair share and so forth like that. Uh, then these investments would have taken place and the Congo would have been a richer place. That's the basic uh, idea. If they and, had – And the converse. So if there isn't good property rights, if you have bad institutions, then yes. there's, there's no incentive to invest in a plow because you'll just get stolen and you'll end up poorer than you were before. You'll have saved up money, made an investment, and you'll get nothing for it. Yeah, so that's the debate. The, they, they tell that story in Why Nations Fail to, to kind of explain how Congo could have had different outcomes if it didn't have extractive institutions, but instead have what they call productive institutions. And, and, and I have to confess, I've, Morton, it, it, it's a very appealing argument to me because I like property rights. I think they are important. But you yeah. make a great observation is there's, there is an alternative explanation. Yeah, I mean, uh, first of all, you know, having – Properly secured property rights is not the same as having properly secured private property rights. Those things are sometimes conflated in the literature. But leaving that aside, the, the basic problem they, they have here is that they're looking at a place where land is abundant. Yeah. So that means that even if uh, to, to just to, to start uh, um, – the, when land is abundant, uh, the supply of it is abundant, and that determines the price will be then cl close to zero. Therefore, there is no incentive for the state nor the, 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 the farmer himself to work out some agreement how to, to agree upon the private property rights here. So therefore, uh, just having the private property rights in itself is not useful. And even if that was taken care of, let's say that was taking care of the private property rights, then the farmer would have then the option to get a cow and plow. If he would do so, he would then bring a cow into an area where there is sleeping sickness. The sleeping sickness would, uh, this parasite would attack the, the cow and the cow would then uh, die and you might also be affecting your whole family and you might all uh, suffer as a result. So that's a, so. Even if the the private property rights in there, it is absolutely not the rational technology to to uh, to uh, to plow uh, to to introduce the cow to plow. And even if there was, even even so, uh, there would also be the the problem of of uh, land being abundant. So why would you plow in a land when land is you rather much rather? then take advantage of the fact that land is abundant and plant around trees and to do, uh, uh, you know, burn down and so forth and do the, the most efficient way of operating in, in a land abundant context. Um, and I think you also said that plowing itself wasn't that productive given, given the nature and, of the and soil. And so, yeah. yeah. And, and, and finally, and finally us, you know, colonialists did discover in Southern Africa when they did introduce their plow and they did plow, uh, soil fertility in tropical areas is shallow so that if you do plow uh, and the rains afterwards, then the land is ruined forever. So the lesson is here that while we want to, we think that one technique or a technology or an institution is appropriate in one place, it does not travel very well. Another good example made by uh, uh, people who study Asia is the kind of the, the way that we think about technological progress being rational uh, in 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 America and Europe, where you introduce tractors to plow and thresher in wheat fields, that's not the same type of technological change or capital to labor ratios that is rational for a rice field in Bali. Uh, a, a tractor would just make a big mess of a rice field, and and so so then I think when you think about institutions more down to earth kind of things about like how to do things, you suddenly reappear to you. No, we can't possibly think that there is one way of doing things and this would somehow work in all contexts. Well, this wouldn't be the first time that economists made policy recommendations or uh, tried to understand something and through lack of their local knowledge uh, made, a, made a blunder. But mm. I, I, think, I think the tougher question, and I thought that was a beautiful example, but the tougher question is – Ask them Oglin Robinson to give them their due. Uh, there is something relevant about property rights in general, right? In this case, maybe it wasn't so important that there weren't property rights in Congo. Maybe that isn't what explains the low agricultural outputs of Congo. But in general, uh, it would seem reasonable that property rights would matter in, in determining growth. 
So when you – and if you had a dictator or a, a, an autocrat or a thug at the top of the political food chain who was exploiting uh, ex, its, its country's citizens and extracting uh, rents from the citizens' productivity, one would – I find it plausible – that that yep. would discourage investment and other and, and growth generally, uh, at least not to start. So, given that that's that intuition makes sense, is your complaint that is your criticism of Asimoglu and Robinson and others who who blame institutions? Say, is it is your complaint that that their underlying argument is wrong or that they apply it inappropriately? I don't think the underlying argument is necessarily wrong. I, I, I do think that most of this intuition makes sense. Uh, you know, we know a little bit about uh, a lot of, to, you know, um, that people respond to incentives. And what you said uh, before is very true. What one of the th- kind of big discoveries in, in African economic history uh, in the 70s and 80s was, you know, to find out that that um, people in poorer countries were not irrational. They were sensible capitalists who make investments uh, according to market opportunities. So I think that that basic intuition I I don't uh, disagree with. What I do disagree quite strongly with is the way it has been empirically measured. Because as I said, it's quite a different thing to say that uh, institutions matter to go along and, and, and start measuring it on a scale from one to three. Uh, because these measures are not very good and they might also introduce um, uh, um, bad behavior in terms of uh, um, uh, in terms of uh, people who, who try to um, uh, behave according to what would be measured as a good thing in, in uh, uh, on the institutional capacity and so forth like that it's also um, I, so I disagree with the way it has been, I think that the argument is more convincing stated as a theory than when it becomes empirical. Uh, I also think that they've overstated uh, the empirical results uh, so that we misled to think that if you now introduce private property rights in Tanzania, well, A, that it would make sense and B, it would cause economic growth. Um, And I don't think that having good sets of governance, democracy, uh, protection of private property rights doesn't have to be defended as an as a cause of the economic growth. You can justify investments or reforms to improve uh, governance quality, democratic rights on its in its own right without uh, justifying it with economic growth. Now it does happen to be the case that the way that literature has gone out very strongly to say uh, the reason why these economies are poor is that they don't have the right institutions. Um, you know, so that they they implicitly say that you know if Tanzania changed their institutions, they will be as rich as Germany or Sierra Leone will be as rich as the UK if they would have the same institutions. And I think that there is a re- massive, re- not only is there a massive reversal causality at play here, uh, that you know I think that rather the development of institutions and economic growth uh, and and all fact is a part of a complex development where it's very hard to actually depict uh, what is the cause and what the, is the effect. And you might also be uh, 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 inadvertently pushing for uh, the kind of uh, uh, like why don't why doesn't Tanzania become more like Germany type of argument or why aren't you Denmark type of argument, and that comes from the way in which uh, the analysis is framed. In the book, I talk about the distinction between doing things according to the subtraction approach and doing things as a reciprocal comparison. And by the very nature of the game here. Uh, looking at global data sets of GDP, global data sets of institutions, and so forth, uh, what has been the what has been done is that in effect you put rich countries on one side and poor countries on the other, and then taken the found, found that the explanations for why poorer countries are not rich is that they are have different institutional characteristics than than the rich countries. And so that, that is, uh, I think, is the subtraction approach. And then pretending, you know, we're very much back into the Karl Marxian view of, of uh, economic history that, that uh, the, the, for a poor country, the, the history of a rich country presents uh, its future. Yeah. So the, this is all a ladder that all countries should grow. Whereas actually, 
the may, if we do believe in, in that history matters and therefore institutions matters and therefore there are different ways to getting there, that actually paradoxically means that the type of research that is conducted in this, uh, what I call the second generation of growth literature, this literature that looks for correlations between income today and his, in the historical data sets should be abandoned in the favor of deeper, more contextual studies of how actually land, land rights system works in Tanzania, rather than just go ahead and assuming that right now uh, the Tanzania would be richer if would be automatically becoming much richer and have higher growth if we manage to introduce a private land titling across Tanzania. There are many reasons why Tanzania doesn't have a private land titling system in place now. The most important one is there's the same as I made in this camp, uh, example of Congo. Um, you know, the, the land plots are small. The transaction cost of titling the land is bigger than the value of, the, of a one-year crop. Uh, and even if that transaction cost was low, it would still be some kind of have to be some kind of uh, uh, institution that could somehow uh, use the land title so that you can get credit, or there might be a state that was willing to w was able to tax them and so forth. But right now, those conditions are not there, and therefore the rational outcome is not necessarily to introduce the same set of institutions which has worked elsewhere. Yeah, I just want to react to that. I think it's. I, I think I agree with you. I agree with you very deeply about this. I think um, when you take such a broad brush approach to saying things like, well, it's bad institutions or it's bad governance, uh, you can't summarize that in a paragraph or two when you're talking about a particular country. And you can't summarize it in a, uh, a variable on the right side of a regression. It, it really has to be a, a deeper, more thorough study. The problem is, is that once you end, end that head in that direction, you tend to start saying, well, every country is unique. Every yeah. country's history and context is unique, which is true. But then yeah. the question is, as economists, we tend to want to learn general lessons. We have a deep urge to find general lessons that would lead to policy recommendations, which is probably not always a good urge. But um, I do want to raise the question that if you – I'm attracted to the conclusion. So let me, let me try to give a, a thumbnail version of what, what we just talked about. If I want to understand why some nations succeed more than others, sure, there's a correlation between success and failure in, in various institutions, uh, culture, norms, trust. These are all vague, difficult things to measure. More importantly, they're very difficult things to create. So if I say, well, the reason that the U.S. economy does better than, say, Russia's is we have this great advantage. And it's not we have a better legal system and, and – and we have a better culture where we can – we're likely to trust each other. And then you say, well, OK, so what can Russia do then to be more like the United States or more like Denmark? Well, they just need to trust each other more. Well, mm. there's no policy recommendation that comes out of that. And I think – so one of the things that I have learned in, in talking and thinking and reading about this is that a lot of the obvious policy recommendations of, quote, more property rights or better institutions are very difficult to implement, very difficult to export – very difficult to import, very difficult to implement. But then where does where do you go from there? And one answer would be, well, you don't go anywhere because that's all there is. The world's a complicated place. You can't easily uh, solve a nation's problems with some magical reform that you can impose from the outside. And I'm drawn to that, although I have to say it's somewhat depressing because it's, it seems to say, well, you don't have to worry about them because you can't help them anyway. Your attempts to help yeah. them are going to have unintended consequences. So you bring in the malaria nets just to come back to an old econ talk uh, idea. And I read yeah. recently a lot of uh, people in the countries that are receiving the cheap malaria bed nets use them as for fishing, <laughs> which, mm -hmm. which yeah. is totally rational because they have problems catching fish. They're near starvation and they're more worried about feeding their kids than they are about getting malaria. So yeah. when I see those kind of results – uh, it tends to make me extremely cautious in in having magic solutions. But is that all we have? Is that where we're left? Is there nothing, no advice we can give? I'm okay with that if that's true. But yep. with your opinion, where does that leave us? Well, I think, uh, you know, when I think Douglas North put it nicely, uh, according to uh, when he uh, – Shortly after he received the Nobel Prize, he was asked whether he had any, for you know, 
putting forward that institutions matters and, and so forth. And he asked whether he had any uh, advice for uh, Russia. This was in the 1990s. And he replied, get a new history. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, and that, that well, kind that's of the same as up yeah, for Be more like Denmark, but I'm not Denmark. Yeah. Or, or, yeah. It's like saying, <laughs> exactly. if I want to be in the, yeah, a, a professional basketball player, be 6'6". Six, six. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. No, so so there is that, you know, uh, and I think so. And and uh, to some side, I should I should also, um, you know, there is a reason why I've been in reading and engaging with this literature for so long as well. Is that I am I'm fundamentally fascinated by this literature. I think the questions of wealth and poverty of nations and these big broad patterns in global economic history. I think that's interesting to read, and I think it's it's a, a fascinating uh, research uh, program to to try to unearth such patterns and, and try different theses and so forth like that. But I think it needs to be done with, with some kind of humility, uh, and which, which, I, which I think has been lacking. Uh, and I think also uh, we need to, uh, I think that, I'm not saying that all of this type of, so fundamentally what I want to do with this book is to, you know, to provide a, a, a way in which, uh, um, students and, and scholars and people who work in development, and non-economists perhaps, how they can engage critically with what seems to be very robust empirical findings for what matters for whom, for, we, for growth and, and development in this world and how to read this economic literature critically, I think. Because I think that's important as trying to, to counterweight some of the, the very self marked self-assuredness, some of these conclusions about what matters and what does not matter for economic growth means. It's also, I think, it's not as if uh, finding law-like statements for what works in economics for all countries at all times is the only way to conduct economic research. Um, there is also more better ways of, of one of the things which I am puzzled by when you look at African economic studies of African economic growth is that they do not longer study African economic growth. They they have sidestepped this this issue altogether. We one the early literature took African economic history as starting in 1960, uh, although that's an artificial year one, right? Um, and there is a longer story to be written, but if the main if if the boundary of investigation is set by what is so far quantified, then you get artificial uh, uh, ways of, of, of thinking about economic growth. Uh, there is also, uh, you know, there are some, you know, yes, I think there might be limits to how many historical data sets it's useful to run correlations with, with the income per capita. I think we reached that uh, limit some time ago. But I think there is lots, I think also one of the problems here is is that in the study of, of African economic growth and African economic development, um, there's also been fewer hands at work, uh, not that many people working on material history, which means that more difficult questions such as uh, doing careful archival historical work to try to understand uh, what, for instance, does Nigeria have a higher tax, do they tax a bigger share of their GDP today than they did 10 years ago? compared to 1980, compared to 1960, compared to 1920. These are kind of empirical questions that could be answered. But instead, I think the, the scientific rewards, uh, you know, in terms of the, within the economics discipline, seem to be that there are bigger rewards for, for coming up with fancy models and more law-like statements about why taxes is important for, for economic growth without having really the data to back it up, nor being able to say something about how tax varied in, in Ghana and Nigeria over time. Uh, so I think one doesn't have to be uh, only on, I think one should be humble about uh, what kind of universal solutions one think about. But fundamentally, this is also about how we train economists. Yeah. So what is it that economists do their PhDs on? Uh, what are the kind of research findings they come out with? And whether are they able to, to, to tell us something useful about the economies which they purport, purport to study? So I kind of launched this kind of a way of, uh, a way of uh, summarizing this is that I make a call for let's try to study economies instead of, uh, 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 instead of studying only economics. So that means that um, we, we might want to, if 
And part of that is, of, of course, the weakness of uh, universities in African countries, that a lot of the research is done outside of Africa, but also with the coming of uh, global data sets, growth regressions using global data sets, the, the distance to the, between the observer, the economist uh, attached to his computer with download data sets and observed the actual economy in question has ever been increasing. Yeah. Uh, so then, uh, and I think macro questions continue to be important. And sometimes economists get it wrong, uh, and it's not all. I mean, we're not we're not exactly sure. I think exactly how useful economists are, but they are of some use. And it's it's unclear to me what use you have an economist who is able to run global regressions about. Uh, which type of quality of institutions determines 30% of the income differentials between Tanzania and Germany, has of rather than ones who is actually good at dealing with, you know, what do we actually know about Ethiopia? What do we actually know about property rights? When was the last time we had the poverty survey? Do we have any labor statistics and so forth like that? So what I'm asking for is, you know, a refocus towards you know the nitty gritty hard work of the counter economists of the of, of of the of the previous years. Yeah, most economists don't like nitty gritty, uh, <laughs> and I'm in that group too. I understand that. I want to I want to try to f- give a different version of your of your uh, critique, uh, the way I would think of it, and you can react to it. Uh, one of the lessons that I think of when I think about these challenges of why aren't you more like Denmark or why aren't you more like uh, the United States or whatever is the case, is that it ignores the organic nature of incentives and markets that processes, institutions that we're trying to, to talk about here in the most vague and general sense, that, that they are emergent. We don't fully understand uh, what has to be put in place. Uh, you know, my favorite examples of this is uh, how do you build a prairie, uh, which I – once read in a, in a beautiful book on management, a beautiful image in management, which is, well, we know how to, we know what's in a prairie. You know, it's a certain set of, of plants. But if I start with a, with a bare patch of ground outside of uh, O'Hare Airport in Chicago, which used to be a prairie, and say, well, I'm going to recreate that, I'm going to really do very poorly because if I just sort of mix all the ingredients together, the right plants, because even though those are the right plants to make a prairie, I don't understand the process by which the prairie emerged. I don't understand that certain things had to be put in place first, that certain things had to come at the same time, that there's a dynamic, organic nature to a prairie that's also true of an economy and to institutions. So I take that, I'm very drawn to that for personal Mm. Hayekian reasons. It seems to me to be very powerful. And the research agenda that comes out of that vision is one that says we ought to be studying how prairies emerge. We ought to be studying how economies mm. emerge. And to do that, it's not magic. You can't just sit down and run a bunch of regressions. You have to mm. do the nitty-gritty work that you're talking mm. about. The problem for me when I think about a profession is that the rewards, as you say, are not in learning just about how the world works, which is what I'm suggesting we should be doing more of. But the rewards are for trying to make the world better. And to do that, you have to come up with – set of policy implications that um, that could save a country 20% give, increase its income by 20%. Merely understanding the history or emergence of institutions, for example, people would go, okay, that's nice. That's that's like history. That's like anthropology. That's like sociology. But but how are you going to – what's the policy implication? The answer might be, well, there aren't any because you can't say get another history and that's the way the world is. Uh, but our incentives are always going to push us toward trying to say, oh, and so therefore we need to do X, Y, Z. Yeah. No, I, I, I like that uh, analogy. And I, I think I think that's exactly exactly one of the – what I'm driving at. So that's a nice summary. And I think – and then exactly to try to refocus uh, African economic history, uh, material history of Africa – our African countries, African economies, would be precisely to recognize that the African continent is not stagnant. It's it, Their growth is recurring, as I emphasize in, in the book. Uh, and these periods of growth, we, while we, we might d- d- derive some policy lessons from, from periods of growth, uh, and we might learn perhaps more from studying 
why certain African economies failed and why certain succeeded than uh, explaining, you know, what did not happen in, in the countries and why they are different rather than to actually study what is emerging. Uh, so, so in, you know, in the, if you're staying with the how to build the prairie, uh, you know, the economists have been explaining for a long while why a prairie is not a desert, you know. So, hmm. the, the, and that they've been trying to explain why, it's, why a prairie is not something else. And uh, so, you know, I think that that's, that's trying to explain how African economies work rather than to explain why they don't would be the, the key, key message for me. I think that one, it's how I, I wouldn't come out, you know, it would be, uh, I would not, I would be uh, bold, too bold for me to say, you know, exactly how, uh, what, what should be the, 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 the responsibility of economists to give policy implications. I think that one, in terms of how I think that economics as a discipline is uh, being rewarded, I think that there are some problems. Uh, for instance, in, in the sense that uh, if you do write something, and I know this from a personal experience, uh, if you do write something about uh, Tanzania, the likelihood that an article uh, will be published on Tanzania is uh, equal to zero uh, in the Journal of Development Economics. Uh, but whereas if you study something which is saying something about Africa uh, as, as a whole, generalizing, you have a bigger chance of succeeding. So in a sense, particularly the, the studies of, of African economics and so forth, uh, there tends to be rewards to to generalize, overly uh, generalizing. And I think that goes from not only publication, but also likelihood of citation and so forth like that. Um, so that, that's a, a real, real issue. Another one is also when economists, economists uh, do publish on, you know, so as I just said, I mean, if it is, you know, Branko Milanovic put it nicely, it said that, you know, it's a paradox to be hearing that history matters and then be uh, confronted with the uh, Wikipedia with regressions afterwards. So, in the, and then, and so that means that if really history matters and really institutions matters, then is this still the domain of economists? At least it should be a shared domain. And I think that main, many of these papers that are being published about how and why history matters, uh, particularly on poorer countries might, if you do publish a paper on, on uh, the effect of slavery on economic growth today, you might want to consult historians of slavery. Uh, and not only uh, uh, think about the robustness of these arguments in terms of econometrics, but also whether it makes sense as a historical argument. And I think, so that's the, a policy implication for the economics uh, discipline, I think. Yeah, I want to I uh, mention before, before we close that uh, the book is very accessible to a non-economist. You do some very nice uh, analogies and examples to help people understand some of the statistical issues we've just touched on barely in this conversation. And you go into them in a little more detail in ways that a non-economist or, or a non-statistician or non-econometrician would, uh, would learn from. So I just I want to put that plug in. But the other thing I want to mention, I don't want to miss, uh, that I learned from the book, which I found um, just sort of shocking for me, is is two, two – I think these are actually facts. I mean one of the things you mentioned in the book is a lot of things – we call facts like how corrupt uh, uh, a nation is because it's a 3.74 on the corruption scale. But these are, I think, close to actual facts. Uh, were surprising to me, and I and I thought about them in ways that I wanted to get your reaction to. So one of them was the remarkable amount of GDP that comes from trade in Africa. I was shocked and, un, and ignorant of that. So that number is 50 to 75 percent over the last few decades. We tend to think of Africa as isolated from the rest of the world, not particularly free trade oriented, and yet a huge portion of their GDP is coming from exports. It should be emphasized, I think I have this right, that those are exports of raw materials, mostly, uh, some production of, of stuff. But in general, the other part that struck me was the other fact I wanted to combine with that is that the very, very, very low population density of Africa, how incredibly undense really how rural Africa is. And it just struck me that one of the flaws with this entire literature, and tell me if I'm wrong, is it just it's it's a primarily 
agricultural uh, – econ- many of these are agricultural economies. They're not urban. There's not industrializa- much industrialization. And as a result, we're applying lessons from – and comparisons across countries that just seem – Absurd. If we wanted to increase income in Africa, it's obvious that we could force people or encourage people to move into cities that measured income would go up. It's not obvious that that would make people's lives better. Uh, but a lot of, of what people I think are are trying to do in in uh, improving African well-being, which is what really matters, is is trying to impose, like we said earlier, models that, that aren't relevant for, for these lives – you know, people living very primitive lifestyles in many of these countries, the ones who are near subsistence, they're very primitive. And, and the idea that we could somehow make them like, an, like a farmer in Kansas or – I mean when it's – if that was your goal, you, you should push them into the city. But that's not what they want. They can go to the city. Yeah. They, they know their cities. They, they evidently have aspects of, of rural life that they like. So I was struck by those two facts, the, the, the fact that trade is very high. But it's, I assume mm-hmm. it's not in finished goods because it's not an industrialized – most of the economies we're talking about are not particularly industrialized. They remain very, very rural because – and I conclude that based on the density numbers. And therefore, yeah. this idea that somehow they are like other parts of the world but just not as not as developed is a total misreading of, of what the reality is. What do you think of that? No, that's, that's – uh, thanks for bringing those issues up. I think – the, the land density and the population density uh, perspective is, you know, if you wanted to point out something uh, that makes most African economies uh, special, have some special characteristics, there are some, exa- there are some uh, exceptions to that rule. Um, Ethiopia has been uh, densely populated, Rwanda and Burundi uh, as well, and therefore have also very different uh, state structures. Uh, you know, the, the example which I made about the, the cow and the plow does not apply to, to Ethiopia. There you have the cow and the plow. And they could also f- put a, foot a, a proper uh, army, which beat the Italians as well when they tried to invade in, in Aden. So there are different uh, types of states. But uh, um, land density, uh, land, there are, the, the typical pattern has been thus far, and it remains to be true in many of the cases, that we're looking at a place where it's relatively land abundant. Uh, so that means that a lot of these technological uh, fixes to, to agriculture is not going to apply. There is, it's not, you know, some people ask themselves, why hasn't the Green Revolution uh, been implemented in Sub-Saharan Africa yet, while it has been in India? Well, most of that is explained by population density and land abundance. A Green Revolution only makes sense if, if uh, well, if land is relatively expensive and particularly uh, related to wages and and uh, related to uh, fuel and so forth, and so that's uh, and um, so that's very very important to to keep in mind, and which you may may misunderstand if you come with this subtraction approach to the comparison and not understand institutions and choices from from the perspective of of, of the countries in question. I think also uh, the trade question is it's also sometimes overlooked. If you br- if you try to draw draw out some stylized facts, which I do in the book, I talk about maybe if you go back 150 years ago, uh, 15 to 20 percent of the GDP was traded in sub in in Western Africa. If you go to the uh, beginning of the 20th century, you're talking 20 25 percent. This increases to to about 50 percent in 1950. And then at, from 1950 to 1975, that share, which is still quite high, uh, is constant, about 50% as a share of GDP. Uh, meanwhile, uh, GDP more than doubles. So both trade and GDP uh, increases uh, very rapidly in the 60s and the 70s. Then you have the economic decline, 70s, uh, 80s. GDP per total GDP is about stagnant for two decades as measured. Uh, and uh, but and so is the share of of uh, export and import as a share of GDP it remains stagnant at fifty percent, whereas on the past two decades this share has has uh, share of trade in GDP has increased to to almost seventy five percent in the highest year just before the financial crisis two thousand and nine, and that's pretty that's particularly stunning when we know that GDP uh, total GDP has almost tripled in the same period. So we're looking at. Uh, not only is Africa not stagnant, there has been a lot of growth, but it also dem- remains not 
in, on the margins, uh, it be, remains deeply in, integ- integrated in the world economy and has been so for centuries. Uh, and exactly how this growth uh, interacts with openness and how institutions respond to that, whether these states are able to tax more of these rents and so forth like that, are research questions that are, are uh, currently slightly uh, overlooked. That also means, as you currently uh, so correctly said, Russ, that we cannot just go around thinking that metrics such as GDP means the same thing in every place. So a 2.5% GDP per capita growth in Germany might tell you something about the efficiency of the labor markets. It might tell you something about uh, application of technology. If you look about that, you might find something about total factor productivity growth and come up with some explanation about why maybe right now Germany is better at implementing good new technologies compared to Finland and so forth like that. But a 2.5% GDP growth in, uh, in, uh, in, in Equatorial Guinea or, or Botswana or Tanzania, where we have agricultural economies, where 75% of GDP is traded on the world economy, when most of GDP growth is determined by quantities sold on the world market and, so and subject the price. To, subject to price variation that you can't control. Exactly. Yeah. So then to go on and build very sophisticated variables to, to kind of like come up with generalizable statements about what total factor productivity was, globally speaking, simply doesn't make sense. You need to actually, uh, you need, need to analyze these uh, economies uh, in, in a different way and think about where, which part of this economic growth is, is important. Do I know something about labor markets? If not, you know, should I use this labor stock data or not? Are they based on something real? So it requires much more fingertip knowledge and understanding of the economy in question than has so far been done, at least in the past two decades. I, I just want to clarify that when I say um, that people perhaps want to stay leading a certain kind of lifestyle, I don't want to romanticize uh, people living near subsistence with children dying young. And obviously people very desperately want to escape some of those conditions. Uh, mm. But it's also clear to me that for various reasons, which are perfectly sensible, people who grew up in a certain way want to are comfortable with that way and are not comfortable radically changing. Not everybody is. Not everybody can emigrate. Not everybody can, uh, as I like to remind people, um, luggage can solve some problems. Just moving mm. is very powerful, but it doesn't solve all problems, and it and it has costs. Uh, so when we talk about people moving to cities and getting a higher income, things some things are lost and they know that. They take that into account. And it's I just think we should be respectful of people's uh choices as much as we can. Having said that, we desperately uh sympathize with, with people who struggle to stay alive and keep their children alive. And I think I'd like mm. you to close by talking about some of the small things, not grand. Doesn't get you um it doesn't save the world in one swoop, but the small things that people are talking about that maybe would make a difference at the margin, meaning a little improvement here, a little improvement there, and that might lead to uh, other things emerging alongside that. So some of the experimental evidence that people are talking about and trying to improve people's situations, the use of cash. Do you have any thoughts on those? Well, I think uh, Pritchett, Lam Pritchett has somewhere – written or said that uh, that kind of randomized control trials, the experiments and so forth are giving very, very precise answers to the wrong questions. Um, so that means that uh, I think it's that those small, uh, carefully conducted studies certainly have, you know, it certainly fulfills uh, uh, requirements of, of rigor and control groups and it's tidy, it's neat. Um, there is the problem that so it satisfies, uh, you know, the peer review uh, way of on how we want economics to be done. You can have it causally clean and so forth. Um, it satisfies that requirement. Uh, it's in the vogue uh, in in Washington. It's in vogue in London and so forth. The question is whether it does give uh, how many experiments do you have to run before you know. Uh, uh, that actually it makes sense to give people free lunch at school uh, instead of giving subsidizing their uniforms 
or or instead of vaccinating them at home. Uh, so before we know whether that only applies to one village in Kenya and one village in India, so how many tests do we have to run before we know that applies universally? But it also is sometimes, you know, there are very careful tests conducted about whether fertilizers work or not uh, for a small-scale farmer. And if everything is controlled and fixed for Researchers find that it is profitable to use fertilizers. But then the big question is, is, is the macro one, uh, which is not answered by that, these tests. You know, how do, does that mean that we should build a fertilizer factory? Uh, how much can we afford to import? Uh, if everyone know, uses do, fertilizer, are the conclusion yeah. is going to be the same? Should it be subsidized? Should it be not? And, and so those things cannot be controlled for and it it remains the domain of the very messy macroeconomics to kind of figure out what's feasible and what's not feasible in this. And I think to answer those questions more carefully, I think, you know, uh, much like... I mean, one, well, I should add that I think that one of the great benefits of this, uh, the tendency towards um, uh, economists to do randomized control trials as well is that it it has created, recreated the kind of the field economist the one that does field research. Uh, so in that sense, it is uh, useful. But I think the, there is still work for the kind of field economist that knows what goes on in the central bank, that knows what goes on in, in the statistical office and understand uh, how decisions are made within the Ministry of Finance. And that's if institutions matter uh, uh, for growth, then that's the kind of knowledge you need, not to know that 30% of uh, the difference between Germany and Tanzania is explained by some ar- abstract way of quantifying the quality of institutions. My guest today has been Morton Chervin. His book is Africa, Why Economists Get It Wrong. Morton, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thank you, Russ. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.